Welcome to the Filmological Society, brought to you by Redacted Media and 6-5 Media. In today's episode, we count down the 100 greatest comedies according to the BBC. And now, here are your hosts, Chris Scholes and Chad Halverson. All right, and welcome to the latest episode of the Filmological Society, where we are reviewing the top 100 films of all time that are comedies according to the BBC. Woo! Chris, I'm pumped. And I'm so pumped. It's I am too. I am too. Even though we are on number 42 this week, but we'll get to that in a second because Chad, my co-host, Chad Halverson. Hello. How are you, Chad? I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I am I am your old, the other host, Chris Scholes, and we have some big news to start out with. Um, we have a new home. A new home. E.T. phoned it home, folks. Yes, we are now part of the six five media family and we could not be more excited yeah we're we're super pumped about this we've been trying to do this for a while now and um now that we're finally here i don't know what to say because i'm just so I, excited i i i do want to say i i want to give a big thank you to jeff bell jeff bellini, bellini yep jeff bellini and ghost hat media they gave us a chance they 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 let us be contenders mm-hmm. and uh, uh, you know, we, we made it. We're, we're, we're in the big show. <laughs> we're with six, five made media. it to the big top. <laughs> right. So um, David Geisler, he's the one, he's the, he's the, 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 uh, the head man there yeah. at six, five media. And he uh, invited us in and he will be joining one of our shows later on. Uh, and we're very excited to have him on. So, so maybe later on, Chad, you and I can talk and figure out, okay, what what weird movie should we have him on? <laughs> and he can be like, what are you guys? This was a comedy? What are you guys talking oh, about? Oh, man, we got to go to the top of the list for that then. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So today, though, before we get into all that new exciting business, which, which again, we are both very excited about this opportunity. But today's <laughs> movie is from 1937. It is directed by Leo McCary. Uh, it is The Awful Truth. It is our second Cary Grant film, I believe, on this list. What was the first one? Uh, the first one was uh, the... Uh, Not Design for Living, no. Arsenic and Old oh, Lace. Duh. How can I forget Arsenic and Old Lace? Arsenic and Old Lace, yes. Sorry, yeah. it's It's been a while since we've recorded, so... Um, Our film brains aren't all there yet, but we're warming up. We're going to be back. We're here. Right. Um, so Cary Grant is the is the the big name. But uh, Irene Dunn is the she is the first one listed. So this film, this film is considered like Cary Grant's breakout film. This is the one that put him up to the A-list okay. for actors in Hollywood. So this this is this is an important film if you're studying Cary Grant, I guess. It- <laughs> Um, Dude, taking Cary Grant, uh, like master courses at your local community college. Yeah. Gonna get a B you know? in Grant. <laughs> this is also, um, so I, I have seen a, another film that's coming up shortly is the Philadelphia story, um, with Cary Grant. And, um, when we review that film, Chad, I don't know. Have you seen the Philadelphia story? I have not. Okay. Um, I think when you, when we watch that one, there's going to be a lot of comparisons to this because uh, Cary Grant pretty much picked up a, a character type, mm-hmm. and he was this character in many films. This was a a a, 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 a I don't want to say a typecast because I think he did a lot in his career, but this is a character that he had for um, a, a number of years. In his, I, in his, career. I mean, in Arsenic and Old Lace, I mean, he basically was this character too, just kind of like a schmarmy, yep. know it all, sarcastic. I, I think the the story of the Philadelphia story and um, this film are very similar as well. Gotcha. Well, I mean, it, it, this film won uh, Academy Award and got nominated for a few others. So, you know, yeah. gotta, gotta strike while the iron's hot, you know? Yeah, including Best Director. Yep. Best Director. So um yeah so the 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 lead was Irene Dunn who I loved in this film. She was so charming. I really liked her performance, yeah. 
Um, and then the biggest other surprise, I'll say, was uh, Ralph Bellamy. One of the Duke brothers. What? That? Oh, okay. That's where he was. Yeah. Okay. That's how they made their money. It was an oil in Oklahoma. Man, I knew he was from somewhere. <laughs> Oh man! Yeah, so so a Duke brother was in this from uh, Trading Places. So I I love being able to make connections like that too. Like, oh, he's in this film. Oh, he's in number seventy four on our list, by the way. Trading Places. Yes. Trading Places. So uh, a good Christmas movie if you're looking for Christmas movies. Not that this is coming out anywhere near Christmas. No. I'm just saying it's a Christmas and New Year's movie. All right. So Chad, you've not seen this film. Mm-mm. What what were your thoughts on on this film? All right, um, watching it. So I'll be honest. I started watching this like really late, like at eleven thirty at night, and I fell asleep the first time. All of all of the movies we watched that I fell asleep. Now it wasn't because it was not boring. a good start of the review. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's a big preface. I, I I was very tired, and I probably shouldn't have started watching this movie. And and when I was tired, I was like, oh, man, I don't care. It's like I, I hear the jokes and they're funny, but I was so tired. I just didn't care. So I uh, uh, went back the next day with fresh eyes and uh, kind of skipped back to the part where I started dozing off and finished it. And it's good. I don't think it's as good as Arsenic and Old Lace. I feel like that's such a tighter film. Uh, but this is very good. I I. I I love the old, uh, I mean, they've been doing this forever, but the, we've watched so many films that involve like either a husband wife duo or, you know, two people that just met and there's like some sexual tension and they're always like trying to one up each other. Those movies are fun to watch. And that's what this yeah. was. Especially when the male and female leads are more equals. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. You know, and, and I felt like with this one more so i mean with with arsenic and old lace it was a cary grant film totally like he was main center point with this film i felt it was about as 50 50 as you can get for 1937 yeah for 1937 you know i mean it's it's she they they both went through their own things they 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 you know it was again I was impressed by her. I had not seen this film either. And I, I grew up, my uh, mother is a huge Cary Grant fan. So I had seen a number of his films, but I, I never had seen this one. And um, like I said, I, I felt that there were some similarities with other films I saw of his, but I, I really enjoyed this. I, I loved Irene Dunn. I thought she carried it. Um, I, you know, like the, the one uh, <laughs> from these early films, like, those old Oklahoma Southern boys yeah. with their drawl and just, you know, being all innocent and, you know, it's like, okay, that gets a little, that gets a little old, yeah but um, still seeing Ralph Bellamy in his, in his prime was pretty neat. Uh, I didn't realize, and this is a deep cut, but I'm a big MST3K fan. And there's a yeah. uh, one of the movies they watched near the end of before the show ended for the thirtieth time, whatever. Uh, Alexander Darcy, who played Armand, um, he's in this movie called uh, Spider Island or Escape from Spider Island <laughs> or The Horrors of Spider Island. That's what it's called. It is so so bad. Uh, way more sexism than this movie even got close to. But anyways, I just love. The fact that he sh his character, there's this moment where Cary Grant is hiding and, or wants to go hide. And then Armand is going to go yes. hide as well. <laughs> there's just this moment uh, where they kind of just realize you know, their their thoughts kind of sink at that moment. And it's like, oh, crap. It's it's, it's yeah. going down. Like, it, yeah, things look like they're on the on the on the way up. And, and they just crash. crash down again. Yep. Yep. So let's, um, um, why don't we do this? I, I'll start doing a plot review. We, we have a new home, so let's do things a little bit. I'm good with that. And we can work together to, uh, to get the plot. So let's, let's do a plot synopsis. Like now. a tag team. A tag team. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. 
instead of putting you on the spot, it was fun. For, you know. <laughs> it was fun making me sweat for 60 films. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so the awful truth starts out there, you know, so Cary Grant's character, um, we'll, we'll use their character names. Um, that way Jerry. We're, we're, we're keeping straight. So, uh, yeah. So Jerry and then Lucy, uh, Irene Dunn's character, they're, they're married, but they're not necessarily close. So Jerry lies about going on a trip to Florida for a week. Uh, and he, he just stays at his sports club the entire time. And, you know, I, and he comes home, he has to get a quick tan at the gym. So that so it looks like he's been in Florida <laughs> and he gets back and he's almost immediately called out by, by his wife, Lucy, that, Oh, nice tan. I didn't think there'd be that much sun with it raining all week in Florida. Um, and then of course, Lucy also has a man at the house who she says, you know, it, it's, it's her teacher and his car broke down and he was tired, so he stayed over. Nothing happened. There's a lot of mistrust on both sides of the, and they decide yeah, to get to the whole. Yeah, the whole premise of this movie is they got married without really getting to know each other. Yeah, and that's really not explained, like how they got to that point. We're just kind of like thrown in the middle, like, hey, these two are married and they know nothing about each other and are super suspicious all the time. Yep. Yep. So yeah. So they go. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. they go to the judge. Yeah, go ahead. You can start here. So they they go get a divorce. So they 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 go get a divorce. You know, they have a custody battle for their dog, which I completely understand if I was in that situation. Yes. Um. And uh, but so she won the dog, but he gets visitation. Yeah, he gets he comes over and he gets visitation with the dog. Poor gentleman. Uh, and at some point. Uh, Lucy just kind of, I don't know, she just has to like, feels ne the necessity of like, has to move on and has to get another man. And she meets uh, this other gentleman, uh, Frank. Is it Frank? Yeah. No, Daniel. Daniel, thank you. Uh, who's like smitten with her, head over heels in love, totally not her type, but because she's still trying to like one up Jerry she kind of goes through with it or at least the motions of it. Uh, there's a scene where uh, Daniel asks Lucy to dance and like, Jerry's like, she doesn't dance. And she's like, well, I'll show you. And she gets out there and they're dancing really heavy and you can tell she doesn't like it. And yeah, uh, that was, that, I, I love that scene. Just her facial reaction. Yeah. Like, and she's trying to hold it together and she's not. Yeah. And she's doing a decent job and then she can't keep up. But then Jerry, at one point, he's, he was like sitting in the middle of this, uh, this table. He kind of like moves to the chair that's closest to the stage and like centers himself so he can see all the action to laugh at her, essentially. And then he pays uh, somebody. He pays the band to play the song again as an encore it's a song. It's a, yeah, it's a really yeah. fast song. And he just wants to torture her. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the type of torture that it's not like there's no malice intended. It's it's more, the same. It, it, yeah, it's 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 like a you know when a when a twelve year old boy has a crush on a girl, he might throw something in her face, or vice versa. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, he's trying to get attention because he still likes her. Yeah, I was gonna say it's the same way I would torture my wife in general. Yeah. Like you do the way he's torturing her and the way that they torture each other throughout the movie. Again, not malicious, but it's something you do to somebody that you care about. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, the, the whole thing was like uh, Lucy starts to feel like she doesn't want to marry Daniel. Like Daniel asked her to marry her. Um, She doesn't want to go through with it, but she's also like trying to be nice about it and, so she's like, all right, well, I'm going to write this letter. And then I'm, I'm still in love with Jerry, you know, I was mm -hmm. telling this to his aunt, to her aunt. Um, so she writes this letter. Jerry comes over. I'm uh, sorry. I should back up. So Jerry's whole thing with Lucy, uh, you know, the reason why he divorced her was he thought he was she was having an affair with Armand. 
and he ends up going to Armand's studio and, you know, he forces his way in and he's just assuming that he's going to walk into some hot, steamy rated R, you know, love making. But really, it's just Lucy singing. I'm a, was it French? Is Armand French? It was opera. It was, she was an opera. Singer. She, yeah. So it was Italian. Yeah. Italian. Italian Thank opera. you. So she was singing Italian opera. He's super embarrassed. Beautifully, by oh, the way. Oh, yeah. Well, she's a professional singer, too. I don't think we brought that up. Yeah. Uh, Irene Dunn uh, did uh, Broadway. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Uh, but, yeah, so he's super embarrassed. He comes over to Lucy to try to, like, say, I'm so sorry. And she's in the middle of, like, ah, uh, um, sorry, you pick it up from here. Yeah, so she... Yeah, so so her her voice coach had come over to like congratulate and, and apologize to for all the awkwardness and all that, and then Jerry comes in, and so she quickly has to hide the musician because she doesn't want to go through all that awful stuff again, uh, in her bedroom, and she gets the door and Jerry comes in, talks, you know, Jerry apologizes and and everything, and then Daniel comes over with his mother who lives in the apartment next but next door and to apologize as well because um all these men are sorry yeah uh, yeah all these men are very sorry man daniel's uh, mom was giving uh lucy like she heard the rumor of the the instructor so she kept pressing it and daniel was embarrassed because of it yep and so uh so she quickly throws carrie grant jerry into her bedroom as well and that's where we had talked about earlier where there's this, there's a very neat scene where Dan, Jerry figures out that Armand is in there by like looking down, seeing another hand slowly turning around saying hi. And then they start swinging at each other. Um, I mean, Jerry, and still then under, they run out. Jerry still under the impression that Armand was having an affair with yep. his wife. Yeah. And so they run out and um, Daniel sees that. So that, that ends that relationship. Right there. Yeah. Over. yeah, Jerry. And then so now Jerry goes on this like bender with this socialite. Uh, yeah. You know, they like pr- like a Kim Kardashian type. Yeah, totally. They and, go boating. Yeah, they go boating like she's a, a, a very rich heiress. Um, Family is very wealthy, old wealth. Um, And and there's yeah, they're on the tabloids. And Lucy sees that and it's jealous being that she's still in love with Jerry and has an explanation for everything is jealous. So she goes down to find him um, poses as his sister Mm -hmm. at a party that is at the, at the house. And um, Jerry says, Oh, she's drunk. That's why she's acting like this, which she wasn't. But um yeah, she starts acting like a like a, a floozy dancer. She claims that, you know, the they weren't from a wealthy family like Jerry had said that they were to get into the socialite graces and um and being overly embarrassing uh to Jerry to this old proper family um that can't handle this type of controversy. So yeah. So Go ahead. You take over from so here. Jer- this is the uh, the ending, the third act. Yeah, the third act. So Jerry is embarrassed. Lucy's, you know, being funny. And he's going to take her home. And they get to, well, she gets to her car. She was drunk by this point, wasn't she? Um, I think she was just acting drunk. I, or I she was just she acting goofy. Some. Yeah, she was, at, she was drinking. She was drinking, but so she was a little drunk, yeah. Uh, so uh, they try to they end up trying to go to a, his aunts, right? Her aunts. Uh I think her aunts. Yeah. Yeah, her aunts cottage or something like that. Yeah, so he's you know, he's like, "All right, you're drunk. I'm going to drive you whatever." They end up getting pulled over cuz the radio knob broke before they left and the music was super loud. These two state troopers come up on bikes. They eventually give them a ride. They're both sitting on the front of a motorcycle. I mean, which was hilarious seeing that. Like, I mean, it's 1937. So, all right. Yeah. Motorcycle laws be damned. Uh, 
they finally get to Aunt Patty's place. She's not there. Uh, is it her uncle or her uncle or the house? Yeah, whoever's taking house, care of the house butler. is there. He's like, all right, yeah, you yeah. know, stay here. There's these two rooms, and you know it's cold and windy out, and they they both kind of like take their separate beds. Like, okay, you know, we'll we'll get through tonight, and this door latch is broken and the door keeps swinging open and they're both awake. And every time it happens, they kind of get closer and closer and they kind of work through, you know, their issues. Basically it was Jerry just being a fuck a freaking pig head about the whole thing. And they, they both had their issues. I mean, yes, Jerry, not listening to her as far as explaining Armand, mm-hmm. but she too, just not trusting him, just, you know, coming back with a tan saying he was in Florida for a week and not explaining what he was doing. But they, they basically make amends and sounds like they're going to try to make it work. Yeah. So, so at the end of the film, there's this uh, neat little, um, uh, gag or, or 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 shot where it's it's a so this is 1937 so this is the height of the um all the different acts to kind of make movies um proper and uh, to put regulations on what you can and cannot show and so Prince. they couldn't show Jerry climbing into bed with his wife even though they're married. Techn- Technically, at midnight, they were divorced. Uh, whatever. Okay. So they couldn't show that scene. They couldn't do that. So they created this, the the director and, and some of the, um, uh, they created a scene with a cuckoo clock where they, and they showed it, I think, three times. Yeah. So it's two little characters. So it was a very tight shot. You could tell it was uh, pretty much a cutaway shot. Um, where it's it's two actors, a male and a female, and they come out and they act like the cuckoo clock would. So they have like little horns that they bring up, and uh, the, and the their cuckoo, rigid cuckoo, movement, like their rigid movement, like, on like gears. an old robot. And they both go into their own doors. Each one has their own door. They come out, they do a little move, and then they go back to their. So the third time at the very end of the movie. What happens is that they, they do the same movement, but this time the guy from the cuckoo clock goes over and goes through the girl's store. So now they're both in the same little hut. You see? Do you get it? They had sex. I I thought it was a clever way to kind of handle that problem. I mean, for the time, totally. Like, well, there was a bunch of dumb rules back then that you couldn't do. Yeah. So um, I think this is a good time. So something that's new that we're going to have to do now is we are going to have to take a sponsor break. What? We have sponsors? Well, 6-5 Media does. Man, we're we're really moving on up, aren't we? Yeah, so uh, let's, let's take a quick pause right here and uh, give it up for our sponsors. Hey there, podcast listeners. I am David. And I'm Kate. And together we host a podcast that you might be interested in if you like The Legend of Zelda. There are lots of awesome podcasts out there and a lot of awesome Zelda podcasts (laughs) out there. That's right, Kate. And we are another one of them. In fact, that is the name of our show, Another Zelda Podcast. And in our show in particular, we talk about some of our favorite dungeons, characters, boss battles. We do a couple top ten lists here and there. We have some deep dive episodes and we even pepper in a couple quiz episodes. Episodes. We talk about our own experiences, we do some review episodes, talk about our challenges, our struggles, and our victories. That's right. If it has to do with Legend of Zelda, we talk about it. You can check out our episodes on our website, anotherzeldapodcast.com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and a lot of the other podcast services that are out there. And you can also check out our episodes on our website, anotherzeldapodcast.com. All right, we will see you there. Okay, bye!
Hey, this is TC. And this is Jim from the Studio Demands It podcast. Where every episode we take a demand from a hypothetical studio. Which could be you. And challenge ourselves to conceptualize, pitch, and craft a film based on the stipulations. Or the demands. We are given. We talk about movies all the time. Particularly, we complain about the choices made in the films we've seen. We're nerds like that. And, of course, like any good nerd does, we automatically assume that we could do better. Even with the demands and restrictions that clearly must have been put on by a production. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com and listen to our previous library of episodes. Our library of previous episodes. Our precious library, Jim. <laughs> our library of precious episodes. <laughs> You're a pirate Smeagol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com to listen to our library of episodes. And submit your demand for a future episode, too. So go do that. Okay, bye. Okay, end of ad. Thank you to our sponsor. I'm very interested in that. I I I I hope our sponsor was used batteries and marmalade. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing that's what I, our sponsor I, is. I also um agree with that. <laughs> Um, for the most part. <laughs> okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, uh, a couple of things. So first of all, um, um, from what I've researched, this film was a highly was highly improv. Really, like, like it was a very high improv film. So much so that Cary Grant wanted to get out of his contract after two days. Wow. He he thought this was just going to be a terrible film. He thought this was going to bomb. Turned out to be a huge success. One of the bigger ones that it launched his career. But I don't think there were as, as many actors that were used to doing improv at the time. I mean, yeah, it's... I, I mean, I'm not an improv historian, but I'm pretty sure improv, what we know is improv now didn't really happen until much after the 30s. Right. And and I thought like the, the rise of improv really came probably in the late 60s, early 70s. And then Saturday Night Live kind of like yeah. introduced it to the world, basically. Um, but yeah, you know, so so the the director was a big fan of that. There was. Um, it was based on a on a on a stage play where the director made some changes from from the stage play. So in the stage play, Jerry's character had a different name. He at one point strikes his wife. Woof. Uh, the fight is over a necklace and not a dog. Um, so that there were some changes made to make the characters a little bit <laughs> more palatable. <laughs> yeah, a little bit better. I mean, again, 1937. Um, you know, I, I have to say, Leo McCary, that's I. I. Uh, I, uh, I, I think he was a, a, a little bit ahead of his time. I mean, this, this is uh, in the throes of, uh, you know, pre pre World War Two. And we still yeah. had a horrible economy in this country. Nobody was working. So yeah, good right. good job, Leo, for making a movie that people actually wanted to see and laugh at and not be depressed. Well, this was one of the the earlier films too. So during the depression, one thing that came out was you had a lot of films about rich people. Mm -hmm. But this one showed them, you know, not being prim and proper, but showing them being more human. Yeah, I guess. <coughs> So that that's something too, and it worked. Um, this was one of the first films where the leading man uh, did a lot of physical comedy. Like this is considered one of the first films where you, because most films up until that point where there was any sort of physical comedy, um, it wasn't done by the handsome leading man. It was done by usually the secondary character. Well, um, what about like uh, all our 
<laughs> well, the, the handsome oh, Hollywood. Yeah, okay. Like stereotypical leading man type thing. Like, like yeah, that that type of one. Not not like Laurel not and any Hardy of like or, the Charlie Chaplin yeah. or any of those. Like, because obviously, but but this is like Cary Grant is handsome Hollywood, prim proper looks looks like everything, and and he's doing slapstick. He's doing um, physical comedy where he's falling down. He's He's getting beaten up basically a couple times. <laughs> so With yeah, some judo. Um, yeah. And then uh, the dog probably was the most famous actor in this film. <laughs> <laughs> the dog's name uh, in the film is Mister Smith, which is a great dog's name. Yeah, perfect. Um, but it's really um, uh, either Asta is his professional name, but Skippy was the dog's uh, real name. So they, if you look on imdb.com, Asta has his own page from all the films he was in. Um, he had a reputation of nipping and biting and growling the actors as he was trying to play with them. And there's actually a scene where Cary Grant is playing with him and, and you can see that he gets nipped. He gets bit in the hand. Um, yeah, I, you know, but this, this dog was in, in just a ton of films and I am surprised we don't have a list of dog films. Oh, look, he's got a producer credit too. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he, well, he does have the writing. Credit. Yeah. He's on the soundtrack. So, <laughs> so yeah, he's in a lot of the thin man movies, which is a series of films. William Powell who was in one of the films that we saw before and liked. Um, this was his big series, but, but yeah, he was a, uh, he was a pretty famous dog. Probably lived a pretty good life, but you don't think it was yes. rough for him to be in Hollywood. <laughs> Woo. This is the kind of jokes you're going to get here at six, five media folks. Yep. Yep. yep Enjoy yep, it. Yep. Um. Yeah. And, so what was kind of neat too is is with this there were this film was popular enough that all the stars would come back and they would do different radio shows recreating the film, um, like at the twenty year and ten year mark and things like that. So um, I thought that was interesting that that they would come back and do that. Oh. Yeah. So what what stood out to you with this film? Uh. Afterwards, you know, doing research since we're talking about history and behind the scenes stuff, yeah. the fact that this was the first of three films that both Irene Dunn and Cary Grant did together. Uh, yeah. The other two being I, my favorite wife and Penny Serenade. I, you know what? And I'm interested in seeing more of what she does. I've not seen an Irene Dunn film before. And I, like I said, I was, I was. I, I, you never, you know, there, there are good in every era. There are good actors, um, but sometimes, especially with an actor like Cary Grant, you don't need to have a strong female character or a strong secondary male character because Cary Grant is the reason why people are seeing films or is going to this film. Learning that this is the film that brought him to that A level status. Um, to me, yeah, it was important to have a strong female lead in this film and i thought irene dunn was one of the stronger ones i've seen in this era of films that we've watched before in the comedy like she seemed very comfortable with comedy and yeah looking at her background it is not comedy this was her second comedy film that she did um so yeah i agree with you chad what i'm saying i uh, i mean she was nominated for a bunch of oscars she never won uh, you know, she did a lot for the arts later in life, you know, working. I mean, she lived in L.A., but. And the fact that she's just a, a wonderful singer, uh, it was just a nice. Yeah. Uh, and not that movies didn't have professional singers or Broadway actors on them before, but she just did very good. And it's it's hard to go toe to toe with Cary Grant, you know? Yeah. Like male female water or vegetable like <laughs> it's hard and well and, and and when you don't have much of a script 
Yeah, so apparently. So that's causing frustration already for actors. Um, but, you know, so so after he decided to stay in the film because he had a contract that the production company wouldn't let him out of, so he decided to stay. <laughs> um, Cary Grant, in an interview, said that he felt more liberated um, without there being a script. Like, he didn't have to adhere and didn't have to do exactly what was on the paper. He could be more himself. He could show his own sense of humor, a humor that fit him. And he felt more comfortable. And I think that is why. Because he, you have a strong female lead who held her own. And you had Cary Grant, who was pretty much discovering his character in this film. That he would be for the next 10 years, 10, 15 years. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I give a lot of credit to Leo McCary. Yeah. Uh, did you know that Cary Grant's future wife, Diane Cannon, was born the year this movie came out? He had a few future wives. I believe, <laughs> what? A he? Hollywood actor having more than one wife? Don't tell me that's true. Especially back in the day, back in that day. Yes. In the hot Hollywood. It's probably a professional sport back then. Yeah. I this I love really good movies where the couple can go tit for tat. The the yeah. movies where yeah, you know, it's mostly like a, a male dominated movie and they'll just like shit on all over the the female. But sometimes like there's a mismatch with the male female and the female's too overpowering. And not that I yep. I need a an even structure of dynamics but in comedy like this it just it, it clicks very well when both of them are on the same page and then and you know you believe that these two i mean they know enough of each other to push each other's buttons mm-hmm. but not enough to know each other like that they wouldn't cheat on each other you know mm-hmm. it's a good film so yeah yeah so um irene dunn was paid Seventy-five thousand dollars, which would be equivalent to one point four million today. Mm-hmm. Cary Grant was paid. Any guesses? At least quadruple that. No. Same. Fifty thousand dollars. Wait. So she was seventy-five. He was fifty. Yeah. So wow. So, Although he yeah. wasn't like Cary Grant. He wasn't the big star. Right? Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Then. So, and he was so at, at the time that he signed. Grant was a. Um, free agent he was not you know because this is the time that the studio system so actors were signed by the studio and then you would do 10 films or whatever your contract said and then you had to sign a new deal um so he was a free agent so this was like one of his first free agent contracts that he was able to get so yeah so he was um 90 000. so she was paid essentially in today's in today's money, fifty thousand dollars more, or sorry, five hundred thousand dollars more than he was. Man, does that never happen ever? Yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's something, right? You know, because that that is not common. Um, that obviously doesn't happen today at, at all. all. No, we're perfect nowadays. Everything's yep. even, Stevens, <laughs> or even Stephanie's. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stephens. Even no, Stephens. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so so yeah, I mean that and um yeah, I mean those little tidbits about this film just you know, again, make it more more interesting to me that that, you know, Cary Grant was not top billing. It was Irene Dunn. Um this was the director's second major film. Um and he had demanded he demanded a salary of a hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> which would be three point four million. <laughs> this... um, and so I, I read this tidbit that he he was meeting face to face with the studio head, who outright refused that offer. Said, "There's no way we'll get somebody else. Yeah. That is way too much." So then McCary went over to the piano and started playing show tunes. The studio head was a huge fan of Broadway. And thought, well, you know what? Anyone who likes that kind of music had to be talented. So <laughs> had to be worth a hundred thousand. We we better pay him. Wow. And you know what? I'm I won't even interfere in this film. <laughs> so 
It's like, okay, okay. So, yeah, I mean, overall, I I really enjoyed this film. I thought, um, yeah, the 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 um, before we get into the final review, what did you think about the clothing in this film? I mean, the costumes. I I, I guess you caught me at a moment where I really wasn't paying too much attention to the costumes. I'll say that they were. I all right. I did like the hat gag. I know that's really yeah. not costumes as a whole but there's this gag where armand came in first and he had a hat uh and then jerry comes in and he has a hat and they get mixed up and jerry takes the hat and it's way too big for his head and she's trying to explain like oh no that's the style that they're they're probably going for nowadays you know that you probably have it on backwards it's on backwards it's the over the ear look that's how it's supposed to be (laughs) uh but I, I will say, like, all the socialites look like they were socialites. And there's this the yeah. part where they're riding in the boat and they're wearing, like, full-on rubber suits because they don't want to get wet, apparently, on a <laughs> boat. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, what are you going to tell me about the costumes that I missed? Well, this this is considered um, uh, Vanity Fair. They consider this one of the top 25 most fashionable movies ever. Um. If you get a chance to rewatch it, look at like especially Irene Dunn's dresses. Um, and so my I, I watch this movie with my wife, and my wife is uh she's um keyed into to fashion designs and and all that, and she was just like these are th- like the designs could work today. Like it's it's. <laughs> You know, typically, like, especially when you watch some older films, like, yeah, they're, they're going to be dated outfits, especially when they're for the uh, uber rich or, or high society, like high society outfits. They go out because they're more trendy. Right. Yeah. Um, but the some of the patterns and some of the designs. um, She was like, yeah, that's that's really pretty. That's really, And there are a couple of times, too, where I'm like, that's a very interesting outfit that that Irene Dunn's character is wearing or an interesting hat type thing that she's wearing. So, um, yeah, I just want to see if you had, uh, notice that at all. Uh, no wonder I didn't because I, I am the least fashionable person I know. It's true. Hmm. Still may have an eye for it, but <laughs> so this film was budgeted at $600,000, which included obviously the actor salary. That'd be, uh, about ten point eight million today. So it's it's a good amount for a comedy. Yeah, and then it it did. Uh, I think it was how much was it? Sixty million. Which equates to. Well, sixty million in today. Oh, oh, that's okay. So their budget or their the return is sixty million in today's numbers. Yeah. Go. Sorry. How oh, dare you? I know. Oh, I'm saying I'm IMDb Pro. But <laughs> 600,000 was the estimate, but I, I had seen it was like, yeah, between three and 600 million uh, in today's money. So they definitely made their money back. This was a huge hit. Um, again, there's a reason that they kept bringing it back every 10 years with the original cast doing radio shows, recreating their characters. Um, doing slightly different stories and all that. So, um, and you know, at an hour and a half, it's a very tight film. Like it's a good film. There's a lot that happens. And, um, yeah, it was a fun film. Um, the, you know, I kind of jumped the gun, but what did you think of this film? Yeah. Like I said, uh, besides falling asleep early on, which wasn't the film's fault. Right. <laughs> just make that clear. Just to make that clear. He was tired. I was tired. And he said he shouldn't have started the film when he did. That's true. But he did it anyway. I, but he did watch it again. I did. Uh, I still liked Arsenic. If we're going to go Cary Grant, I still like Arsenic yeah. and Old Lace better. Uh, because I, I loved how that was like a bottle movie. Where it was really mm-hmm. just in that apartment. And then it had the old guy that thought he was uh, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt and all that other stuff. But again, this movie, like all the stuff I said before, the the husband and wife duo or the you know divorcee duo 
the duo that knows each other and can play off each other on their their hopes, their insecurities. It, it just makes for a very fun film. That it, and especially knowing that it was improv most of it, like they could have been talking about anything, and I think the performances still would have been as great. Um, I don't, I don't really have a terrible. I, I would be interested in watching the other three films that these two are together in and, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of making a judgment on what is the better of the three. Cause yeah, I might like arsenic and old lace in it uh, better than this movie, but you know, Irene Dunn isn't in this uh, arsenic and old lace. So no, yes, it's giving me a a motivation to go back and watch uh, the trilogy, the Holy trilogy, if you will. Do I have to give it a rating? Do we do ratings? No. Okay. No, I don't think we've done ratings. I think we started and then we just ended it. Yeah, been, so, sorry. <laughs> so um, just to clean up what I said before, the film made uh, more than $3 million in in uh, in total box office receipts, which is equivalent to $54 million in today's dollars. Nice. So it was a good film. And again, this film shot up Cary Grant as a leading a-list actor uh, created the Cary Grant persona, and he became such a fan of improv that he demanded that in his films after. So basically, they'd write a loose script, and he'd be like, "All right, yeah, I got the gist of it, and I can do this. Throw it out. I'm Cary Grant. I'm Cary Grant." <laughs> um, yeah. I I did enjoy this film. I, I think I had seen Arsenic and Old Lace a number of times. I think we both had. And, um, or did, was that the first time you saw I, that I, one? I, my mom, it was her favorite movie growing up, and I barely remembered okay. it, so. Um, so I think the newness of this one kind of got me liking this one a little bit more if we're talking Cary Grant. Um, I, I... For me, the the fact that the two lead actors worked so well together, and you know, learning later about the, um, you know, the the improv that was done in this film, how comfortable they both seemingly became doing that, mm-hmm. um, I I thought led a lot to that that cohesiveness that they had. And so for me, I like this film better than I liked um, Arsenic and Old Lace. Again, Arsenic and Old Lace is great. It deserves to be on this list. This film deserves to be on this list. And I agree that it should be higher, but you know, we'll see. We're, we're, we're coming up. We have, um, yeah, where are we now? We're, uh, we are, well, that was 42. 42. Okay. So we have, we have a couple of films and we're going to have uh, the Philadelphia story at 38. That's our next, um, film with Cary Grant, and that's the one where I think we're gonna see. Um, I'll be asking you the question like, how different is this than the uh, than the awful truth? Like, what are your thoughts? Good, just don't ask me about the costumes again, Jesus. Well, now I will no. every time. <laughs> that's taking over. That's gonna take over for the okay. Do the do the plot. Right. Five minutes. Right. Go. The lady's dress she wore is very pretty. That's gonna be <laughs> what I say. Okay. So our our next film, well, well, first of all, any final thoughts on the awful truth? No, I think we've we've covered how awfully good it was. Yeah, our next film is uh, from two thousand six, and it is a very different character. We're looking at <laughs> uh, Borat, the cultural learnings for of America for making benefit, glorious nation of Kazakhstan. Oh my, you butchered it. It's Borat. Cultural Learnings of America for Make Benefit Glorious Nation of Kazakhstan. Yeah. Thank you. Larry Charles uh, directed this film, Uh-oh. but I don't think many people know who directed this film. No. I mean, talk about improv. We're yeah. going to be getting heavy into improv with this movie. I think there's barely any movies on this list where I think both Chris and I have seen before going into it. I'm assuming this is one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just watched this when the sequel came out last year, so it's pretty fresh in my memory, but I'll definitely watch it again. Yeah, it's um, 
I, yeah, and I think what's going to be interesting is just when I saw it in 2006 and seeing it now and knowing kind of why this character came about and what he's trying to do. Mm-hmm. I, you know, like that has become more apparent now. Yes. To to what it was when when he did it back then. So we will get into that. But this has been the awful truth. Um, thank you, Chad. Thank you, Chris, um, for joining again. I I like doing these with you. So, Aww. um, as we like to do here, and and you can, you know, if this is your first time hearing us, uh, we do have our our full library, so you can go back and listen to all the other films that we've reviewed in not only this show, our countdown show, but also we have some in um, you haven't seen what where one of us has a film that the other hasn't seen and, and we present it. And also uh, the central line where it's films that everyone should watch. If you want to um, understand where <laughs> film ha- has come from um, and some of the influences of today. So they're all out there and we're going to be making more shows. Thanks to uh, six, five media. Mm-hmm. So as you like to say around here though, Uh, Lord loves a working man. Don't trust Whitey. See a doctor and get rid of it. Thank you, everybody. Later. Thank you again for listening to the Film Illogical Society. If you'd like to listen to similar podcasts, please check out 6.5 Media on Stitcher, iTunes, and Facebook. Or check out Redacted Media on Facebook or YouTube.